I'm going to enjoy tonight our talk with Rudy Garza. Uh, let me introduce Rudy. Rudy is the founder and managing partner of G51. Rudy focuses on the development of all portfolio companies and G51, syndication of partnerships and deal flow. Through mentoring as well as serving on portfolio company boards, he is instrumental in driving success through defining and then guiding the implementation of well-grounded business and marketing strategies. Rudy is an expert at finding and defining businesses and revenue models, market shaping services, business growth strategies, and talent sourcing. Rudy has served as an investor and board member of over 20 companies, selling several to publicly traded firms, including SAP, ADP, Prudential, and Cisco Systems, amongst others. Rudy is also an active leader in the venture community, as a longtime member of the National Venture Capital Association and the Texas Venture Capital Association. He has served as chairman of the board of the University of Texas Alumni Association, i.e. the Texas Exes, in 2011. And in addition, Rudy is a lifetime honorary trustee of the Dell Children's Medical Center Foundation. Rudy, welcome tonight. Thank you, Laura. Well, I've, I've got a few prepared remarks, and then um, I've got a brief uh, presentation to talk, share and talk about some topics that I really love and enjoy, and then, uh, and then we'll open up for um, uh, my favorite part, you know, you know, questions from the audience and getting to share perspectives and, and input and feedback. So um, I want to start off by, you know, wh what a fantastic day to be uh, speaking on UT campus. Uh, I don't know if everybody is aware of this, but uh, Bill Gates uh, dedicated uh, the new uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Computer Science uh, Center. And um, at the same time, you know, they donated $30 million, uh, and Michael and Susan Dell donated $10 million, and it was all part of a $120 million uh, facility and Department of Computer Science uh, funding uh, that's taken place. So exciting things are happening on UT campus and you know what what starts here uh, it changes the world and you know what the world's starting to notice and uh, they're starting to support us in our efforts with really significant significant gifts like this so um, it's 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 really wonderful uh, the things that are happening what I'm hoping to be able to do today and I'm really talking more to maybe some of the students. I see there's some, you know, we've got an older crowd and a younger crowd. And so, you know, I'm going to focus a little bit probably more on the student side. But um, I'm really hoping to kind of kind of grab your brain and maybe stretch it open just a, a little bit wider than, than uh, maybe uh, it is today. And uh, to share some things that might give you a new perspective or a new way to look uh, at your life and your education and the things you, you're going to try to do in the future. So, uh, of course, you know when you're running late, you, there's always a sheet or two missing, as there is tonight. So, um, a little bit of this is just for memory. But um, what I wanted to do is, um, uh, especially for the students, I want you to put yourself. Uh, in a perspective tonight and right now, just for, for the next hour or so, of thinking of yourself um, as your own entrepreneur. And in, in fact, you really are, because um, if you look at yourself as an entrepreneur, as a student, wherever you are in your education right now, you have an investor. And maybe you have an angel investor, which could be your parents or your friends or a trust that's funding your education. Um, you may have a banker, which would be your student loans that is helping you fund your education. Uh, or you might be a bootstrapper, where you have a little bit of the other two, and you know, you're working, and you're fighting your way through your school and making it all come together. So you have to, if you take that perspective, you have to ask yourself, okay, I'm in my first, second, third, fourth year um, as an entrepreneur for myself, you know, how is my investment paying off? How is this investment? Is my personal IRR looking pretty strong right about now? Is it fair? 
Is it great? Is it awesome? And if it's awesome, you know, keep it up. If it's fair, if it's great, you know, there's some new opportunities that you can take advantage of. And th some of those opportunities is just the real change that's taking place across the UT campus. And if, um, if you look at what's happened and just in the last 24 or 36 months around campus, uh, UT has changed the face of the opportunities that students here have in front of them. And they're doing that through entrepreneurial organizations, student entrepreneurial organizations that have popped up. Uh, they're doing it through Texas Venture Labs. They're doing it through uh, three-day startup. They're doing it through one semester startup and on and on and on. So, you know, the opportunities you have to improve and um, really uh, push for great IRR on your personal um, entrepreneurial uh, career path is really terrific based on the new things that are happening. Collaboration across campus um, is turning into more of an everyday thing where in the past it was really inconceivable that you could put together a major and be able to get course credit for trying to start a company uh, while you're in school. It was just unthinkable. So all these kinds of things are, are setting you up for really a great future and, and great success. Um, you know, when you finish your education here and you stop and look back, hopefully, you know, actually, I want, to, I want you to think about what you will say when you graduate. Um, about your experience here at the University of Texas. And I, I want you to think about, God, if, if you were Michael Dell, you know, what, what, what would you be saying to people about your experience on UT campus? One thing Michael would be saying is there were no opportunities to work across campus, across different schools, and work with engineers and do all the kinds of things that now are readily facilitated um, for students that are here now. So think about what you hope to be able to say about your UT education and really put yourself in a place to where you can be proactive and take advantages of all the things that, that we have to offer um, here on campus. Um, I know that there are world-class entrepreneurs on this campus today and I hope that some of those world-class entrepreneurs are sitting in this room with us right now. Who's going to be the next Michael Dell and who's going to create the new technologies that's going to take our society much, much further as we move along? So I desperately want to encourage all of you entrepreneurs on your own startup path um, to take the next step forward and to keep moving forward. The, um, Opportunity is right in front of you. It's right in front of your face. It's in your pocket with less than two degrees, two or three degrees separation. The network effect is alive and well, easier than ever to take advantage of. Access to many of the internships, jobs, mentors, investors, advisors, and other entrepreneurs are sitting on your smartphone one click away from LinkedIn. A lot of students I talk to these days don't take advantage of some of the most simple um, networking effect and network creation tools, and that's just a fantastic tool that's available to you. So another aspect that I want you to pay attention to, because a lot of students don't do this either, and I know this because I talk to a lot of students, is don't miss the basic network of your family, your family's friends, your friends' families, and, and your friends, professors, mentors, and advisors. Because if you really reach out and think about and do your research and do your homework about who's available for you to talk to and get advice from, raise money from, um, bounce an idea off of, think about a revenue model for, help explain the market structure for a potential investment, you really probably have a 
pretty close access to getting out and connecting with those individuals. So do yourself a, pay, do yourself a favor and empower yourself to make that happen. Um, the, the other thing I think that is important is to, to get out and show up, you know. Show up with your own network and take some risks. Take some risks to go to talks and events like this, to meetups and to conferences, conference like South by Southwest, for example, and let your intuition sort of drive you to sh where you show up and when you show up. Trust yourself and learn from those experiences. Um, I just receive amazing blessings whenever I go from you know, meeting to meeting, and there's just this unusual knack um, for me that's happened over and over again. I just happen to meet amazingly talented people and really interesting people, it seems like, almost everywhere I go. And I know there's people like that in this room. I'd love to meet you as well. And sometimes I end up working with those individuals in really extraordinary ways um, that are, begin lifelong relationships. I showed up for my first venture capital conference in San Francisco in 1996 and um, met John Doerr with Kleiner Perkins. Uh, Kleiner Perkins is a world-recognized venture firm in Silicon Valley. And six months later, I syndicated my second seed investment with John Doerr and um, Kleiner Perkins. So, you, you know, I mean, really, if for those of you that don't know, that's really a pretty amazing event, right? I mean, me syndicating my second uh, sort of seed investment with uh, John Doerr is a, it's pretty much like, um, you know, Mumford and Sons asking me to do, be backup singer during the Grammys in a live <laughs> performance, okay? So um, it, was, it was really an amazing opportunity for me and it helped put G51 capital on the map. It reduced a number of barriers for me because, you know, my gosh, once you've invested with Kleiner Perkins, you got to be okay, right? Um, so uh, that, that really kind of opened up a, a great opportunity for me. Then, uh, then it wasn't long ago, I showed up at the National Venture Capital Conference Association in San Francisco, and there was a man sitting at a table all by himself. So, you know, I go sit down next to him, um, and he sees my name tag and sees I'm from Austin. And uh, he says, he says, Rudy Garza, you're from Austin. Um, I reinvent myself every 10 years, and I'm going meta on innovation, and I'd like to do that in Austin, and I want to work with the University of Texas. I said, so, well, you know, what's your name? He said, well, my name's Bob Metcalf. And um, for those of you who don't know, Bob Metcalf was the inventor of the Ethernet and the founder of 3Com. And so my response back to Bob was, well, Bob, you don't know this, but I'm currently the president of the UT Texas Alumni Association, and I'm probably the, one of the one few guys that can actually make that happen. And three months later, um, we were so proud to be able to announce um, Bob is our new professor of innovation through our engineering school. So, you know, you just, you really never know. But if I hadn't, of, you know, taken the risk and spent the money to, you know, fly out to the National Venture Capital Association, I wouldn't have had the opportunity. So, uh, I want, as young students and young entrepreneurs trying to invest, uh, leverage your investment in your own academics, um, take those chances, trust your intuition, and go places. Because, uh, you know, I, I, want you to, I want you to experience that kind of success and that kind of serendipity that is available to each and everybody in this room. Um, Bob regularly says, let's make Texas uh, a better Silicon Valley. And I agree. And I believe the way we do that is by sharing and collaborating with all startup ecosystems across the nation and maybe across, across the globe. And I think with that kind of a pay it forward mentality and culture, um, we've got a phenomenal opportunity to make Texas and make Austin, make University of Texas, just an amazing hub
for the rest of the nation and the rest of the world. Because that kind of connectivity and transparency in the venture capital industry and the and collaboration with the angel community um, and with the incubators and accelerators across the country, that kind of collaboration is, um, is not happening um, on a broad national level. It's happening on a statewide, citywide, or regional level, but it's not happening on a broad, broad level. So we're a natural fit to do this. People from across the country and the world are coming to Austin. They visit our city. They say, the city's great. The music's awesome. People are so friendly. And, um, you know, we are. We're helpful and we're easy to work with. Uh, Austin and UT is on the global stage. South by Southwest has just been a tremendous asset for us. F1 is a new budding asset for us. But already, um, we're getting calls from uh, potential investors out of Europe and different parts of the world that even 12 months ago never necessarily would have had an interest in investing uh, in Austin or Texas. So great things are happening and I think we're well positioned to leverage our strong moral character, our get or done attitude, and uh, our collaboration mentality for science, technology, and the good of all mankind. So what starts here changes the world, and that concludes my prepared remarks. And now I'll jump into the presentation, so, it, unless you want to jump in and steer I, me a different direction. Well, I'd like to steer you a slight direction. Let's come back to the presentation. Okay. You call yourself a Texas super angel if I look at your tweet yeah. name. Can you uh, share with us what a Texas super angel is and how you, for these folks, how how you can, how the category of super angel is, has derived? Yeah, so um, it's basically as funds develop, um, there's clear markings, um, you know, around angel uh, investments and the types of companies that match up with angel investments. And then there's uh, um, opportunities around smaller funds like ours and we typically have been raising roughly $10 million funds, and we've done several um, in sequence. And then there's the later stage sort of traditional venture capital firms, which are, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so as we were scratching our heads and looking at, you know, what we wanted to call ourselves, the category is more is referred to as either a micro VC or um, super angel. And I just didn't like micro VC. <laughs> and, I, and I thought super angel sounded better. And I'm kind of into, you know, connecting Texas and technology and Texas with the world. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really against um, sort of closed in cities, right? That if you're not part of that tight end ecosystem, then you know you don't belong here and you can't play here, and it, you know we're not going to treat you very nice. I'm really more of um, let's let's collaborate um, lo regionally, nationally, and globally, and try to have a, a massive impact. I mean, I would I would love to create a million jobs from the investments we get involved with over my career, and the only way I can make that happen is by um, really uh, working with other cities, other universities, and, um, and a lot of different investors from across, across the country and across the world. You know, I know uh, that you've syndicated with a lot of investors. You started with John Doerr, but I know you've syndicated with many others. As a super angel investor, how do you go about doing that, especially when they're not local? Well, it helps to do your second deal with Clyde and Perkins <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I happen to know that you've got some phenomenal contacts across the country. Yeah, that you've yeah at. no, I mean it's um, so so. Really, the way the way I was able to um, connect with all these you know, amazing and brilliant venture capitalists from across the country was going to uh, the National Venture Capital Association and not just showing up once. And you know the uh, the first time I went to the conference and said, you know, 
bright eyed, you know, dark haired and fresh faced. Uh, you know, I'm hi John Doerr, I'm Rudy Garza, I'm from Austin, Texas. I'm out here to learn the best from the best and um, take it back to Austin and, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, start my own firm. And so he was, you know, very, uh, very patient and very nice. And, um, but not all of them were that patient, not all of them were that nice, frankly. Uh, and, but the third year I showed up and could visit with John, and then they'd heard I'd done a deal with them. And, um, you know, it just takes consistency in execution and performance. And, and, sh and again, getting back to this showing up, um, showing up at the National Venture Capital Conference and, or helping start the Texas Venture Capital Association and then going everywhere every year and being there, that consistency after a while, people, you know, understand that you're not going away. You're for real. Um, you, you back up the things that you say you're going to do, and you build a, um, a brand and a trust uh, and a franchise that uh, really helps you on all fronts. So um, get out, meet people, um, go to conferences that you think would be helpful to your company, your business, yourself. And those things can really have an amazing impact. And, and do you look at that using your terminology, consistency and execution of performance? Do you apply that to the companies, to the entrepreneurs you look at, the investments you make? Uh, How I'm, do you look at those? Yeah, well, you know, it's, um, again, showing up uh, consistency and execution and performance. When you have an entrepreneur and you make an investment with an entrepreneur, and you both make money, then guess what? They want to work with you again, and you want to work with them again. And the more that happens, the more people you have to reach out and, and that will be part of your bench of entrepreneurs that can step in and fill a critical role as an advisor on sales, marketing, uh, technology, engineering, um, you know, uh, legal structures, uh, sales structures, uh, sales growth, compensation management, just all those different kinds of things. It's so helpful to have really brilliant people that you can reach out and, and connect with. So, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that are, are super, super helpful. And so when we look at uh, entrepreneurs and, and the reason it's, it's not easy, I was going to say the reason it's easier for us, but it's not easy, it's hard for everybody. Um, the reason we're willing to take risk with first-time entrepreneurs is because we know we know we have people that can shore up their their weaknesses, and um, we know we have people. And sometimes we won't make an investment. We'll work with a company for a while, mentor to mentor them, and um, until we find the right fit. And then all of a sudden, if the right fit and the right person comes along, that we know is going to make a phenomenal partner, investor, or an employee as part of this management team, then that'll be enough to get us over the line to go ahead and pull the trigger and make the investment and, get, and turn the company on and get it going. When you work with a first-time entrepreneur, what do you look for? Uh, there's, there's a few things we look for, and there's several different opportunities for first-time entrepreneurs. Um, one is drive, right? Um, you know, success no matter what, right? You're just driven. Some people you just know are driven and you know no matter what, this guy is going to make this company a success. Um, number two is domain knowledge. Some, some first-time entrepreneurs are just phenomenal technical people and, and, um, and, and technologists and architects to be able to quickly whip together and pull together a prototype and um, show that they can deliver not just uh, you know the lightweight prototype but also the architecture and and, um, and the horsepower that it'll take to turn that into a commercial grade application that then can be used by you know uh, hundreds of thousands millions or hundreds of millions uh, of people and there's there's different people that can do those different layers. Um, and would you compare that to someone that perhaps you've funded before 
or an entrepreneur who's doing it, you know, coming to you with a, an idea that has yeah. been successful on a prior occasion? Um, you mean like to compare and contrast? Compare and contrast what you would look for differently in, in that person who's, who's been there, done that. Well, I mean, we like both. Uh, you know, we, um, uh, we're invested right now in a, in a company called Mimeo. And, um, and so the way Mimeo came to us is um, we spent a fair amount of, uh, of time at Rice University. And um, there was a guy named Alex Kazim. And Alex um, was an early employee at eBay. And when they bought PayPal, he was, became the president of PayPal. Um, and when they bought Skype, he became the president of Skype. And so um, Alex um, sends me an email, Rudy, I've invested a little bit of angel money in this company. Uh, I really like this entrepreneur. So uh, um, why don't you meet with him? So the guy flies to Austin, meet him, fall in love with this guy, you know, um, uh, Vietnamese immigrant, uh, age 11, uh, puts himself through school, goes to work at Apple, and um, you know, learns amazing things about design and, and uh, technology architecture. Um, does a, a startup uh, and has some success, and then um, and then and then has this new idea. And he shows up and he says, "Hey, um, you know, I turned this thing on. I set it up for free, and uh, in 30 days, we've you know, we've had." Um, 40,000 downloads uh, in 17 countries uh, uh, across the world. And, um, and so I liked him a lot. His, his, <laughs> he, you know, he was, he was brilliant, he's humble, and just so smart. And, and, um, but he needed, he, needed, uh, uh, he needed some support. He needed a vice president of business development, which we just happened to meet. Another you know, great meeting. Um, a guy that had moved to Austin, from, uh, he was a, a VP of BizDev from Netscape. He was looking for his next opportunity, and so we just matched the two up, and, and um, it's, it's been an exciting company. Do you think you spend a lot of your time not just looking at the opportunity to invest and how you're going to do that, but syndicating the team as well as syndicating the investment? I, pr I probably spend more time talking to people, um, you know, to talent, talent sourcing. I generally say I spend a quarter of my time um, working with the portfolio companies, uh, a quarter of my time on talent recruiting, a quarter of my time in investor relations, and a quarter of my time fundraising. And so it kind of ebbs and flows um, among those things. But, but um, the consistent things that we're always involved in and that we love doing is um, meet, meeting new people that are you know coming through Austin and want to move to Austin and and um, that are passionate about technology and have done amazing things in their past or they want to do amazing things in their future. It's just it's really uh, it's, uh, amazing. Well, Fun. let's listen from some of those amazing people in the audience. If you have a question, if you could please go to one of the microphones. There's one on on each. Um, before before we do that, please. I, I just have to show a couple of slides. Okay. 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 Get ready right. to go to the microphones. Yeah, get ready to go to the microphones. <laughs> okay, so, and, and uh, this is on Lake Austin, right? And it's a, it's a guy, it's a young guy at UT named Michael Hart. So if you all know Michael, you can give him some grief. Um, all right, so entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, and job creation, it's at a full frenzy. It's a national, global full frenzy that's happening. It's taking place on all levels. Three years ago, five years ago, it wasn't. It's elevated to the highest levels in government, and everybody's focusing on it. Um, capital formation stitching. There's more options for funding than ever before, and therefore, you've got to be thoughtful and elegant in the way you're going to go about funding your company and building your business and building your career. I'm going through really fast. You're doing part, great. Part of the key is to find a, this, that was that's my son, so you can give him grief when you meet him. Um, but part of the key to the success is finding the right kind of funding and the right level of funding, and matching that with where you are in um, the evolution of your business. Right. Um, 
One of the things we're doing on a national scale to take advantage of the, the complexities of um, funding stitching and the complexities of the entrepreneurship uh, market expansion across the nation is we've turned on what we call our venture scholars. We work with graduate schools across the country and um, some basic stats of you know where we are, where we think we'll end up, um, some of the companies that uh, our guys and gals get to go work at. Uh, geographic dispersion, these are these are the universities that we'll be working with, you know, hopefully within the next 24 months. We're at 10 out of these 20 uh, today, and um, super excited. You know, we have 20 some odd interns uh, assisting us and helping us, and uh, they're located all across the country. We had to develop software to be able to do that, so we have a cloud-based um, deal review system where we give everybody a username, password, and they can get access to cool startups that are happening from all over the country. As a consequence, our deal flow in the last 36 months has kind of gone like this, and we went from reviewing maybe 800 companies a year to probably a couple of thousand. Uh, greatest renaissance of all times. You know, you can build a company faster, reach more people, and reach international people faster than any time in the history of the United States. So it's a, it's a wide open door for everybody in this room. Um, these are some of the partners that Laura mentioned that we're working with. These are our current partners and these are some of the um, portfolio companies that were in the spaces that were on one of the earlier slides. If you think about where we fit, um, we meet people all along the process and we'll mentor them, mentor them for a while um, until we get the right stars aligned in terms of team and opportunity and market timing and those kinds of things. And then when it lines up right, we'll provide the funding. And, um, and then one of the more attractive things about G51, again, is going back to our syndication partners, when it's time for that Series B round of funding, uh, we have access to pretty phenomenal partners that we've known for a long time. Take advantage of the Texas Exus. I have to plug my, my alumni association. It's a fantastic organization. There's um, you know, over 100 chapters all around the world. Just about any major city uh, in the world, you can go there and there's going to be a, a Texas Exus chapter. So take advantage of that and take advantage, of again, of the network effect that you can create. Um, this was kind of funny. This happened, this was from today. Uh, I don't know if Taylor Barnett is in here. Taylor, are you in here? Okay, oh, there you are. All right, good job, right? Two years ago, three years ago, you'd never see Bill Gates uh, and Michael Dell, uh, you know, well, you'd see Michael in Austin, but you'd, you just wouldn't find Bill Gates hanging out in Austin, right? Now, it's part of this whole amazing campus and amazing uh, entrepreneurship movement that we've got going on. And, you know, hey, he's here on campus. And, you know, she, she I've never been really affiliated with Bill, um, <laughs> much less in only 140 characters. So this, <laughs> this, that was pretty exciting for me. Uh, Larry Chang is also a friend of the firm. And, and What's notable is, you know, we're going to have people in Seattle that'll see some of this. And Larry's out of, he's a, he's a, he teaches um, engineering entrepreneurship at Stanford. And so, um, you know, we're, we're getting, we continue to get great exposure for the university, just in, you know, even sim simple things like this every day. All right. So now. Questions. More questions. I've got a question. So. How do, or do you have a background in technology, and how did you get interested in investing with technology startups? Okay, good, great question. Uh, I do not have a technology background. Uh, my first job was working with a family engineering, uh, environmental engineering company, and my dad was an engineer. And I loved working with my dad, and I loved working with engineers. So. If you think about it, in the natural progression of things, um, 
trying to design a roadway or a water treatment plant or any sophisticated uh, infrastructure, um, there are project milestones that you've got to meet. There's project schedulings that you have to set up. And it's, it's not radically different than planning out product development for a software product or a hardware product or any of those kinds of things. And so it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a huge stretch for me to um, feel like, well, all of a sudden I'm going to be working with all these engineers. Um, I was really used to working with engineers, and I really enjoy working with engineers. And, uh, and actually, I feel a little bit like I can help empower some of these engineers to become successful by complementing their skill sets with some of the things that, that uh, we understand. The reason we focused on early stage is uh, the, our engineering company was, grew to about a $3 million a year business, so it was a small business. And as I was starting and making investments, you know, I wanted, to be, I wanted to be sure that if I made an investment in a small company and something didn't work out, that I could step in and run that. And I felt very comfortable that at least for you know, the first zero to three to maybe five million in revenues, I felt very confident being able to do that and do that in a, in a, in a successful manner. So those kinds of things added up for me um, to uh, empower me to follow a little bit of intuition and jump into the space. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Um, so my question was, when you invest in companies, uh, what, is, what are the qualities, I guess, that you look for in startups? I mean, what is, because it, it's very hard to evaluate a startup company. It's not like they have a long history. They don't have financials. Um, well, you so. know, people, people say, God, it's so risky, it's so hard. But it, <laughs> it you know, it's like, um, oh, man. Um, it's like if you, when you came to the university and you were trying to figure out which dorm or which apartment you went into, you were going to, you know, live in. Right? The, the first one, you probably spent an hour you know, or 30 minutes. And the second one, you probably spent 20 minutes. And the third one, you probably spent five minutes. And, but after you saw four or five of them, you, know, you could probably drive by it and look at it and say, there's no way I'm living there. Right? <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of the same kind of uh, sort of pattern recognition that you get with startups. And you know, when, you, when you see uh, when you see a thousand companies a year or two thousand companies a year and you talk to so many people you learn a lot about people and you learn a lot about these companies and you, you can easily uh, the, the easy part is you can always spot the deficits in startups right the hard part is saying and, and visualizing if one or two variables change how could this turn into a magnificent opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's the hard, that's the hard part. And then believing in yourself and the team uh, and that the amount of money you're providing as a group or a syndicate, believing that that amount of money and that team is actually going to provide consistent execution and do what everybody expects and wants them to be able to do, right? So those are the kinds of things. And pe people in startups with different backgrounds you know, will have different um, tendencies. And some are good, and some are not so good. And, and you know, being confident to, to work with those uh, different nuances of personalities and characteristics is, um, is, a, is another piece that you've, you've got to get your head around. Uh, because you know, start, the startup business in very early stage investing it's, it's very up close and personal, you know, it's very mano a mano, you know, because you're, uh, um, you're working with someone's baby that they have spent hours and hours and sacrificed food and sacrificed fun and sacrificed all these things to get it up and going. And then if you walk in the door and you say, hey, your baby's kind of cute, you know, <laughs> but maybe, you know, if she was just a little taller, you know, it might be nice, you know. But so, so it's, you know, if you put it in that perspective, all of a sudden, it, it's, a, it's a personal, um, it's a real personal kind of relationship you have to build, and you have to build that up pr 
pretty quickly. We have another question. Uh, hi, Charles Neal, uh, computer science senior. All so right. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty convinced that awesome is, Austin is blossoming on a national scale right now. And the name recognition, I mean, you mentioned it already. Bill yeah. Gates wouldn't have been here years ago. So I'm convinced that on a national scale, we're really growing. What would, what would you say are some, some maybe areas around the globe uh, or areas of, uh, of knowledge in Austin that we could maybe collaborate on a global scale in? Okay. Well, I mean, I'll share the kinds of things that, have, that are coming to me today. Um, so one, one of the schools that we're working with is called the Holt International Business School, and it's a one-year accelerated MBA program, and they have campuses in um, London, Boston, San Francisco, Sao Paulo, and Dubai. And, um, you know, we're working with some of their students, and a lot of their students are from, I mean, they're from all over, from Kenya and Iran and, you know, all, all over the world. And, and so they're getting exposure to us, and we're getting exposure to them. Um, there's universities in Europe that are calling, you know, they're, they've heard about the Venture Scholars Program. They're trying to figure out, you know, how we could turn on their university. They want us to come over there. Um, Italy has been particularly uh, active. Uh, we're getting uh, inquiries from Germany. Uh, seems to be kind of waking up a little bit. Chile um, and, and Brazil. The, you know, and three years ago, you know, it was just no heartbeat, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, over the last, again, 24 to 36 months, it's really waking, waking up quite a bit. Cool. I'd like to go visit pretty much all those places. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right? Thank you. I hope I get to as well. Hi. Um, how, do you over, how do you see entrepreneurs successfully overcome the problems of competition and traction, i.e., how do you how do entrepreneurs convince you to invest in their company even though there's somebody already in that space but they believe that they might be doing that incorrectly they might have the wrong model yeah the um, the, the 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 key to that when you're going into a market is is to have just a um, um, a, a radical differentiation in your business model right and that, or, or in, let me say it, in your business. And that can be in the business model. It can be in the product function and features. It can be in the te technological approach of how you're doing something. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can create a, just a, a, a wild and radical differentiation for you and your company in a market um, that maybe has half a dozen competitors, right? And it's going to be in one of those, kind of one of those stacks usually. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think the last question for this evening. So, hey, Rudy, it's nice to see you again. Yeah. Ryan Zimmerman, yeah, uh, hey, Ryan. mechanical engineering student here. Yeah. I was curious, what is not only your biggest success, but also your biggest failure? Yeah. And what did you, what was the biggest lesson you learned from these? Sure. Um, you know, one of the, one of the the biggest success isn't the funnest to, to hear about because it was pretty it was pretty stand, it was kind of you know you invest in a company it gets big and you sell it it was good but the the <laughs> funnest success so I'm gonna, so I'm going to focus on the fun success and, and and all our exits by the way all our exits are like you know fourteen to eighty million dollars okay um, and um, so the biggest success was the 80, right? But, um, but the most fun was like the 14, and because that, it happened in 12 months. And so, um, you know, we, there was a, like, I guess the, the founder of the company was mid-20s. Uh, he, um, he had worked at the Center for Cyber Warfare in San Antonio, had been at the Pentagon, uh, had been, um, had had a stint with a group called the Wheel Group that had sold to Cisco Systems, but he was like, you know, he was like the coder, you know, down here, and uh, and then he came up with this uh, with this concept, it was basically next generation intrusion detection, and showed up on my door, uh, had a CEO, really liked the the 
the technical founder didn't like the CEO, wasn't the right fit for us. Um, and so we kept talking to him, talking to him, and it took a while. Um, finally, the CEO left. Um, we knew some people that he could connect with. Um, he liked, fell in love with one of them. He became the new CEO. We wrote the check, gave him, a, we were the only investor, million dollar check. Um, and, um, you know, it was exciting because uh, we had been at it for probably you know, hard, really hard. And these guys worked around the clock um, doing all this coding stuff. And it was had to be really bulletproof because it was in an enterprise application. And we had gotten um, beta customers with, uh, you know, um, UC Davis, uh, uh, CIA, um, NASA. And so we had some pretty nice uh, people that were testing out the product. And so we were going to need some more money. And um, we had a term sheet from a nationally recognized venture firm. And, uh, and by the way, the, our funding, was, this was like 2001, OK? So it was just a horrible uh, market. And uh, you know, I put my fist on the table and said, we're not, you know, not going to stop investing just because of what happened in New York City. Um, we're going to keep investing, and, and the, everything lined up for these guys. And so we went ahead and wrote the check. And a big check, right? A million dollars on $10 million funds, a big check. So um, you know, uh, long story short, the, we had a national VC with a great term sheet. Um, we, on our own volition, went out and talked to Cisco. Cisco said, we'd like to do a strategic investment. We go back to the VC, hey, you need to increase the valuation because now we have the strategic partner that wants to be part of the deal. And so you need to increase the valuation. I said, well, yeah, I don't think we're going to increase the valuation. So the, the, that was a head scratcher. And it's like, OK. So you know, we sat down around the table, and we said, all right. If, um, if we sell to Cisco, you know, CEO, you're going to put several million dollars in your pocket. We're going to put several million dollars in our pocket, and so on and so forth. And he was engaged. He was going to get married. And um, so you know, we sold the company. Uh, we ended up with about $4 million worth of Cisco stock at $12 a share. Um, the next year it doubled. And frankly, it's one of the only reasons we're here today is because on a vintage 2000 um, VC fund, um, pretty much most of our investors got all their money back from the, that Cisco stock and that one investment. And then they kept investing with us, where a lot of vintage 2000 funds w went away because you know, they're, sign they're really negative. So that was, that was the funnest for a lot of different reasons. Well, I think I can say on behalf of everyone here, thank you, and it was great. Hang on, let me tell you about my failure, though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to hear uh, about right. that. Yeah, because you know, failure, um, failure's important, and while while nobody nobody wants to have failure, failure's really important. So I, you know, I, I kind of I sort of think it's important that you guys hear hear about it, and um, and hopefully, what we try to do is we try to learn uh, from each failure. Right, and we sit down and, and look back and say, okay, what do we, what could we have done better? And um, the most recent failure we had is we invested in a company called Other Screen, and it was in North Carolina, and the uh, the CEO was a guy that we'd known for many years, a repeat, very successful repeat entrepreneur, and jumped in. We uh, we funded half a million. Um, the team funded half a million, so it was a million dollar round, which we structured and led. And you know, they they got into the deal, and this guy is a world class salesman. He worked with my wife Teresa for many years at Dell, and and just was a standout VP of sales guy. And they worked and worked and worked, and could just not get the traction. And what they were focusing on is. Uh, advertising media sales and they had a unique engagement model that then they could take to uh, content providers and, and broadcast partners to increase um, ad revenues. Well, you know, 
note to self, don't ever try to sell advertising um, and during a uh, presidential campaign for TV spots, right? Because they were completely sold out. And, uh, and you know, second note to self, um, you know, we, sh we should have, we, you know, we had the opportunity to maybe bring on some more um, broadcasting um, strategic either investor or board member and those things didn't happen they didn't happen fast enough so um, the real money for those of you if you're thinking about doing an investment in media the money is not with the broadcasters it's not with the content producers it's with the brands and so if you're gonna focus on that market go after the brands because that's where all the money is great thank you again all right thank um, this has been phenomenal I know there's many, many more questions. So please, uh, those of you who can ha hang around, please join us uh, for a reception. Come talk to Rudy, and I'd also like to very much thank I'm Teresa gonna, I'm, Garza. I, I want to add one thing I forgot yeah. to mention. The CEO and the founders um, came to that conclusion. Uh, they shut the company down and returned half the money. So out of the half a million dollars, we basically got two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars back. So you'd look at them again. Yeah. So we'd look actions. at it. So we'd look at them again. So uh, again, if you're going to fail, fail fast and realize you're failing, so you don't use up somebody else's money. All right. On that Great. note, thank you very much, Rudy. Hook them horns, everybody. Thank you.